places in the world that are rumored to be haunted. And then there's the Malvern Manor, which is known to be. guest investigator Heather Taddy on December 2nd and 3rd as we spend back-to-back nights investigating the haunted Malvern Manor as featured in my forthcoming docuseries, A House in the Harbinger Kingdom. Only 30 tickets are being offered to this special event, which tickets are on sale right now. To get yours while they last, visit www.aghtelevision.com. What's up, everybody? Chad Kalick here, and welcome back to the Inner Crowded Room podcast, where we are going to get into a very uh, long Q&A episode here, because it's been a while. There's a ton of questions here, uh, a lot of repeat questions, but some really good new questions as well. But before we get into that, as you guys saw at the beginning of this podcast, the live events are back. And I am so stoked to have one on the books and more coming. And uh, if you guys haven't been to the Malvern Manor, I'm telling you, this place is awesome. It was also a filming location in Harbingers, where some madness definitely went down. I love this place, and I love how Josh Hurd, the owner, runs it. I mean, it is our place. You show up, he lets you in, gives you the walk around, and pretty much... Uh, either goes ghost hunting with you or just takes off and, and lets you handle it, man. It, it's the right way. He runs it the right way. You know, nobody wants a tour. You want to investigate. And uh, it's it's awesome. I'm stoked to get back out there with you guys. Uh, it's been a long, long time. And there's good reason why. There's a lot, lot going on, guys, behind the scenes. I can honestly tell you I have never, ever been as busy as I am. I'm recruiting help locally to get through the stuff that I have right now going on, and you're going to hear about a lot of it very, very soon. But if you do want to join me on December 2nd and 3rd at the Malvern Manor for AGH Presents, a weekend in the Harbinger Kingdom, which my good friend Heather Taddy, uh, which you all know from Paranormal State, Portals to Hell, Alien Highway, she's going to be out there for the whole weekend as well. 30 tickets available, that's it, and there's actually only 17 left. So if you want to join me, jump on it right away. Visit aghtelevision.com for tickets. I'll put the link in the description box below. It's going to be a banger. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Having said that, let's get into this, guys. There's a lot of questions here, and you know how we do this. I like to get the repeat questions out of the way first, and then I, I, I try to focus as much as I can on unique questions and just things that are different so I'm not doing some repeating Uh, Although there's always a bit of repeating because there's things that need updated. And the first thing I'll answer, and I get questions about this all the time, 
uh, is how is Craig doing? How are you doing? Are you still both experiencing high strangeness in regard to the Cerno phase two phase case? I'll be honest, things for me, there have been some weird computer stuff, um, but that's been pretty consistent since everything, since we started focusing on the alien side of this. Um, but I haven't felt in danger for a while, which is which is good. I have my fingers crossed, but I cannot say the same for Craig. Um, I actually just got a message from him two days ago. Uh, he's now completely locked out of his Facebook page. Uh, he doesn't run that anymore. So uh, any messages, any posting that you see, anything from Craig on social media, he's not running it. Someone's hacked it. Someone has control of it. Um, there is a number of things that he's going through uh, that are being documented, uh, first and foremost, just for his safety, um, but also for Pale Face uh, when I am able to get over there, which will hopefully be in the new year, 2023. Um, but I do want to say this, man. If by chance this is somebody that's just savvy with computers and and hacking, um, and it's just somebody, you know, like I said, that just wants to have, you know, fun messing with somebody. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's truly not funny. If, if that is going on and that's who has control of Craig's stuff, please uh, give it back to him. Um, those guys have been through so much. I mean, when you are consistently camping, camping, because that seems to be a safer location to sleep than your home, you know, this is serious stuff. And that's been one of the hardest things about this whole process is like, when, when you release these documentaries, these are movies. And to people that watch them, right, to people that view them, and there's, there's a degree of entertainment to it, and there has to be to get people's attention. And I totally understand that. That's how people learn. That's how they become interested. Uh, that's how uh, awareness is raised through uh, putting things out in a way that's entertaining. Like I said, what's really hard about that is that this is this is a real life and a real family. And this is all really going on. 100% of everything you have seen in Cerno Phase, Two Phase, Phantom Rider, 100% of it has been real. Without question. So please keep that in mind uh, when you watch this, that these are real lives. And... You know, Craig has kids that I dearly love, and I, I love his wife to death, and the guy is suffering, and he's he, he's scared, and uh, that is the update. I know that's not a fun update, you know? I, I know people want to hear that everything's chill and it's all cool. Um, it's not. It's not all cool. And uh, Craig's become like a brother to me, man, and anything I can do in my power... Uh, to offer him protection and to fully bring this story to the light, um, I'm going to do. And Pale Face will come out. And we have been documenting this entire time. And believe me when I tell you, you are going to be floored when you see what has happened and what we've uncovered and uh, stuff that we intentionally held out of Phantom Rider because in telling the story, it makes more sense to include it in Pale Face but when you guys just see who's involved with all this, it's it's very scary. Um, but I do find it interesting that when I changed my focus, uh, as far as my filmmaking focus, to Harbingers, and I start putting my time into that, then things for me become a little more tolerable. Almost like I'm giving them what they want, like lay off, chill out with it all. Um but Craig's not able to do that, you understand? This is his case, his footage, and he has over a hundred hours of additional footage that he's not reviewed from that island. And I don't know how much I should say right now, but my guess is there's a lot. My guess is what's going on right now, there's a lot to do with that. Um, this isn't something that Craig can just turn away from. You know, this is his life. This is the path he's walked. And uh, I don't know what the future holds for myself or Craig, but Craig clearly seems to be the target. So uh, that is the update. I wish it were a better one. And I, I do believe in the future we'll have a better one. Um, but that is the update. 
right now. Okay, moving on. Um, a lot of people ask me, so I just shortened this question, and I really want to clarify this again. And the question is, uh, do I have some kind of beef or personal issue with Jeremy Corbell or uh, like one gal said, do I sense uh, some competition? I just want to say this again. Absolutely not. If you go back and look at all of my videos, I've, I've not singled Corbell out. Uh, since the beginning, I talked about how I was suspect of uh, Tom DeLonge. Um, I, I've been suspect of all of these guys. Luis Alzando or Lou Alzando was the first guy that I pointed out that I just said, I don't buy this guy. I just don't believe him. I just see acting. I see poor acting when I watch him on screen. And a lot has come out now uh, through the incredible investigative work of the New York Post to really expose Alzando that he is not who he says he is. Um, and I want to make this clear with Corbell. Again, I'm just going to, I'm going to say it again for the, on the record for the final time. Jeremy is a great filmmaker. Okay. I said this after watching the Bob Lazar documentary, uh, which if you haven't seen it, or if you don't know the story of Bob Lazar, you should see it. It's a very good kind of, uh, it's a representing of the, you know, the tale of Bob Lazar. Um, and it's done well. Uh, I think that Jeremy, I think people misunderstand when I said he's a better director of photography than he's a storyteller. I think people took that as like, that's some kind of backhanded slam. Uh, it's not. There are different filmmakers that do different things better than other things. Saying he's better at being a director of photography than he is a storyteller doesn't mean he's a bad storyteller. It just means that he's better behind the camera with visuals than he is with story. Um, but, you know, to some degree, you have to be a decent storyteller to find success, right? So there's a lot of, you know, of my favorite directors that I could point out things they do uh, the best. I love Wes Anderson. And I think Wes Anderson's strength is, you know, set design and visuals. Like he creates this visual style that is louder than his voice. Um, and I love that about him. Does that mean he has no voice? No, not at all. So I think that comment was taken out of, uh, you know, out of context. Um, and when it comes to what I do as a filmmaker versus what he does as a filmmaker, like I said, that is comparing apples and Volkswagens. Like they're just two different animals. There is no comparison. Uh, that's not to say I'm better or he's better. When it comes to art, it is subjective. Whatever you are looking to find and what you like, uh, there's no wrong opinion. If I think, um, you know, Anton Fuqua is a crappy filmmaker and someone else thinks he's, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread, we're both right. It, these are just opinions, right? Uh, my films are very raw. Um, I like inserting the camera where it just doesn't go uh, and, and, you know, bringing people uh, fresh, you know, perspectives in the moment as things happen and really capturing the vibe, you know, in the heart of the moment. Uh, my films are very musical. Um, his are not. Does that mean he doesn't use music? Well, of course he does. And he does sound design and all that. But if you watch my films, there's, there's, there's three voices. There's the voice of the, the cast that's in the film, that collective voice. There's a narration voice. And then there's a third voice. The music is always telling the story in my films. It's something I've always loved doing. It's something that makes sense to me. Um, in real life, I, for whatever reason, I'm kind of bad with words in the moment, but I'm, I'm great when, it, or well, I, I think I can better explain my feelings when I write music. Okay. When I personally write songs that are my own, for some reason, I always seem to find the right, the right note, the right way to express things through music. So that's always carried over into my filmmaking, uh, which a lot of people really enjoy. Some people don't. I remember when I first watched The Magnolia, and I think it's the greatest film ever made by Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, when that scene comes, 
Uh, it's not going to stop. And the whole cast begins singing this song. I mean, I was floored by that. I was blown away that as a director, he literally broke that wall because music is supposed to be a secondary element. And he broke the wall and made, you know, that song a voice in the film. And I remember thinking how spectacular that was. And, and it just moved me. And in the theater, it was like the only the second time in my life I've cried during a film. And uh, just that whole, it's not going to stop until you wise up and watching all those lives intermingle and collapse on each other. Uh, it was just, it was powerful. Um, so what I do is just very, very different than what uh, Jeremy does. So no, there is, there is no uh, competition. Um, we would both have to be making the same thing to compete. Uh, outside of the fact that when we make films, I think that's about the only real comparison you can make to his documentaries to mine. Uh, he also likes very big, uh, very slick, bright colored, um, you know, visuals that uh, are just like large in scale, like physical scale, right? I'm not talking about conceptual. He likes big visuals. I like super intimate, up close visuals. If you think of American Ghost Hunter, you know, during the scene with my mother, when I went back in to really try to confront her to get her to get help, I mean, that camera is in her face. It is in my face. It's inches away. Um, I mean, that's how I prefer to film when I'm investigating in my films. There's times where the camera is literally inches away from my face. Um, so, yeah, it's just there's differences. So I don't have any issue with him whatsoever. Like I said, I urge everybody to go check out his films. Uh, he's one of the guys in the paranormal field that actually makes good stuff. Um, when it comes to his role in this uh, rollout, uh, which we can now officially say this has been a government rollout of this UFO narrative. I, I have nothing against him. I have questions about his role in it because I don't think he's being honest. It's an, it's an opinion, okay? It's just an opinion. I'll be the first person to say I could be wrong, and I would love it if I were wrong. But I just don't understand how he is removed from the Department of Defense when suddenly, you know, every new UFO video that comes out and every new piece of classified or, or formerly classified information, it all comes through the same funnel. And when you ask him, how are you getting access to this? How are you the one that consistently releases this stuff? You know, his answer is always like, I got a great personality. That's bullshit. That is not what, I, I don't buy it for a second. Uh, I would love to sit down with him. I would love to tell him to his face, look, if that's your real answer, I don't buy that. At the same time, if you're involved in certain ways and you just can't talk about it, I understand that too. You know, it, I remember Tom DeLonge gave the same answer when people said to him, why you? Like, why are all of these, you know, these guys that are connected, suddenly they circle you? And his answer was the same way. Oh, well, I have such a great personality and I was so into this. And I pushed really hard. It's like, man, you can't really believe that, right? I mean, there's a lot of people with great personalities and they, they're not, you know, walking into classified footage and, and classified information. Uh, I just have questions for him. You know, I, look, I, I don't have like, a, a, there's no part of me in general in life. My friends would tell you this, man. I don't, I, I don't like shitting on people and I don't like assuming the worst of anybody. Um, so that's why when I have questions, I bring them up because I would like them to be resolved. I would like him to answer the questions that have been put out there by myself and by everybody else. Uh, the same thing like with, uh, uh, you know, the drones that he called triangles. I, I am certain he knew that those were not uh, triangles. I'm certain he knew that that was a bokeh effect from the lenses. And he has since responded where he said, yeah, whatever, fine, it's a Boca, but no one is saying who are the controllers of those uh, drones or whatever they were. He's like, no one's saying who was controlling them. The military's not saying who controlled them. 
Well, my honest best guess with that is we probably controlled them. There was probably some kind of test done. There was nothing in that footage that was amazing. They were, I mean, drones with FAA lights on them, it looked like. You know, that piece of footage didn't show anything spectacular. So, you know, there's there's new machinery all the time that is tested, and they, they, they do tests all the time to, to find out how, you know, we respond to things. Um, maybe if they didn't tell you who the controllers were, maybe it's just something that, you know, you don't have access to that information yet. And, and if he's involved with, you know, the military, and if he has a clearance, then maybe he just doesn't have that high of a clearance. I don't know, but I would love to sit down with him, man. I mean, you know, not to attack him. I, I have no reason to attack him. You know, I would just like to say, hey, man, there are some real questions that I have that I think are making you look bad. You know, I I would prefer you be one of the <laughs> one of the good guys that's telling the truth and really like pushing a proper narrative that, that is filled with facts. I want you to be on the side of the public, and there's some things that have been done that. Uh, don't make you look, they make you look bad. So answer those questions, man. Like prove that you're not a part of, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, operation to misinform the public. That's it. So I, I'm trying to be faster with my answers here because we got a lot to get through, but uh, that's exactly where I stand on Jeremy. Uh, not, I have no beef, not jealous, not angry, don't dislike him. I would just like answers and I would love to, Someday, have a beer with him and just kind of find out what he what he knows and what's really going on. That's it. Um, okay, and I'm trying to get through this one as fast as hell, too. I've gotten hundreds of emails asking me about the whole Johnny Depp, Amber Heard thing. And I'll just say this. I, I, I hated that I found myself watching it at times and that I cared because this is what was pretty obvious to me right away. These are two sick people. You know, Johnny, he, look, he's charismatic, so he's likable as hell. And I don't think for a second that he's, you know, some, like, monstrous person that's, you know, beating up on Amber. The proof never showed that. Um, but if you look at Johnny, he's he's a strange guy, you know. And he's on the stand openly admitting that, you know, he, he has addiction issues, which a lot of people do. I, I do. You know, I mean, like most people in the past, you know, most people have something in their life that they're addicted to and they need to control it, you know. Um, but he's just very likable and he was being honest. And honesty always wins, right? Honesty always wins. But when I watched Amber, what's really hard is, again, she's badly damaged and, and she's clearly sick. She clearly has something very, very wrong with her. Uh, she's a terrible liar. Um, and she just looked like a broken person. And I don't like celebrating that uh, at all. And because I think she's also, as much as she has used um, people to get where they're going, people have used her too. And what do I mean by that is, Look, Amber is, to me, she came off as just batshit crazy. And I can tell you in my younger life, if you've never been in a relationship with a crazy woman, you are missing out on one of the great adventures of life. <laughs> my biggest vice on this planet is crazy women. That just, they just push the dial and you're just always on edge and they just make life so fun until the bubble bursts until that infatuation runs out until the lust is over until, and then you know, obviously they become a nightmare. But if you look and you know, Amber Heard is supposedly having threesomes with Elon Musk. And then of course, James Franco is involved. Why wouldn't he be? He's involved in everything. And then there's Johnny Depp. It's like, why is this girl consistently winding up, winding up with the most powerful and wealthy men you know, in Hollywood and, you know, in the world. Like, why did, Why does this consistently happen with her? I mean, she's beautiful, but she's not like the most beautiful girl in the world. And my honest guess is the girl's crazy and it's fun and she's willing to do whatever, you know, and, and to advance her career, she'll do whatever. 
and that seemed to be you know made obvious in the trial and i i just felt bad for her because uh it's just so easy to attack somebody who's sick and to me she was just very sick he was too he johnny like i said he's just likable he's like he's like cool in that hunter s thompson way who he you know immortalized but there's a lot of sadness with that life you know when you're 50 some years old and you're still trying to live out your rock and roll dream and you're you know dressing up in what are basically costumes that you're wearing on stage and you're presenting yourself like you know half the half the other time you're dressing up like indiana jones and walking around with hats and feathers in your head uh, again johnny is likable but he has a lot of problems and those get washed over because he's just he's likable he's charismatic but obviously there's a lot going on with him um and they didn't belong together but it was just hard for me to watch her because i just found myself again not liking her and having a terrible attitude towards her and almost feeling angry towards her when i i, I know i know who she is i know she is who she is because i've had girls like her in my life and while it lasted it was fun good god but when it falls apart man run and hide because you know yeah it, it's that whole you know woman scorn thing well that's true in life but it's even more true when you find you know a woman who's truly uh, you know truly crazy and she's truly crazy i think she clearly has uh, multiple personality disorder and uh it was just hard for me to watch. So that's my opinion. I hate that it, it, I hate that I wanted to watch it because again, it just, it just made me angry and it just felt dirty. You know, like I felt like I needed to take a shower when I was done watching it. It was just terrible. You know, I mean, how weird is it that they're both in a relationship recording each other and they know they're doing it. So they're, they're always performing, right? Cause they're, they're performing to make sure whatever is recorded is in their favor. It's just, man, what a disturbing, disturbing existence. And it just also shows you, I think with Johnny, you got a brief glimpse into, you know, what do you do when you have all the money, the success and the charisma and, and, you know, just hundreds of millions of dollars. Like, what do you do in life when you're at that point? I'll tell you what you do, whatever the fuck you want to do. And that is how his life has, you know, ran to this point until he ran into somebody who uh, had needs that he clear, clearly couldn't meet. And at the same time, I don't, I don't know how she could claim that, you know, she was a victim in any of it either. I think they victimized each other. Uh, you know, Johnny didn't marry her because she was boring. You know, they didn't have this like shotgun wedding and like run off and travel around the world because she's just not a lot of fun. You know, uh, Elon could have anybody. He's not hopping into bed with Amber and her girlfriend because she's not a lot of fun. James Franco is known for having lines of the world's hottest women. I mean, he's known. I live in this town. Trust me. He has that reputation. You know, he's not with her because she doesn't, you know, uh, you know, outpace those other women. Um, so it's, you know, it's hard to watch that, you know, it's hard to watch it because, uh, here's a woman with some degree of talent that a long time ago lost herself. And, uh, you know, Johnny got away with a lot more and I think he won the case because he, like I said, honesty wins. Uh, anyways, long winded again, I'll try to be faster with this, but yeah, I just wish I wish I didn't care about that whole thing. I'm, I'm at the time. I'm glad it's over now, at least. So, okay, here we go. Uh, what is the latest with Skyfall? Um, well, the the last time I heard from him, that his focus uh, was the web. He kept saying uh, big stuff is coming with the web telescope. And if you guys, uh, I don't know if you just saw this or not, but if you Google web telescope and Proxima B, you'll see that they believe the Webb Telescope has detected artificial light on Proxima B, which is in what Proxima Centauri. It's like one of the 
closest solar systems to us, 1.4 billion or 4 billion light years away, something like that. Um, but they think that the Webb telescope has detected artificial light. Um, so they're looking into it to try to make sure that's a thing. But that's what Skype, he says, the first kind of like, aha, we know for real, uh, we found them um, is going to come from the Webb telescope. And by everything that's going on, seems to be exactly what's going on right now, um, which blows my mind. Uh, but yeah, looking at that story, the Webb telescope uh, detects artificial light on Proxima B, um, which, by the way, Proxima B uh, is a, I think it's a moon, but it's actually in the, uh, the Goldilocks, you know, a habitable zone that we could live. And... Um, which is actually, actually, I believe they think it has better, actually better, like, uh, atmospheric qualities than Earth does. Um, but, yeah, really crazy story. Uh, you know, but I also saw that, uh, um, well, that's the next question we went to. The next question, actually, uh, I put them both back to back here. Uh, Ken Whelan from New York asked, what do you think of China claiming they have detected heartbeat-like radio waves and uh, that may have come from extraterrestrial civilizations. Well, what he's talking about here is they call them fast burst radio waves, and they've been detected for a long time. They're these radio waves, is exactly what they're saying, and they just get detected for like a fraction of a second, just like a blip. And they've detected them all over in, throughout the universe and through the sky, um, but there's never been any pattern to them. So they believe that it's just a part of the universe, these radio waves, and they don't know per se uh, if it's anything to do with any kind of, you know, uh, species or race or extraterrestrial civilization. But supposedly China has detected a frequency that had a heartbeat or, or, or it was like a heartbeat. It was, there was consistency to the fast burst radio wave which some believe the only way that that could happen is if it was artificially sent and in order to be detected. Um, there was a story that China claimed for sure they knew it was from another galaxy or another uh, civilization, and that has been proven false. That was a story that ran in, in like the sun or something like that. One of those like uh, you know, garbage mags that reports whatever they want. But it is true that they detected the short burst radio waves uh, that were like synchronized, like in kind of like a heartbeat. And they're trying to figure out where that is. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically, you know, Skyfall seems to be dead on with the web telescope. Uh, the photos from the web were great. And they're, like I said, they're already talking about the fact that it may have detected a civilization. Um, so that was quick. <laughs> you know? uh, Skyfall, again, it's I don't know how many times the guy can be right uh, before, you know, I, I just, <laughs> before it happens, man, before everything is predicting, the final, uh, the final countdown comes to this fake alien invasion. It just, it all seems to be line, lining up, which is super weird. Um, it's still to this day, guys, it's, it's, it, despite knowing what I know from investigating this case and despite all of Skyfall's prediction, it is still so hard for me to wrap my head around the idea that governments would try to pull a fake alien invasion. It, it's, it will always be hard for me to fully commit to, to belief until it happens, you know, but I, at the same time, I don't think it's so crazy that it can't happen. And uh, there's just a lot to consider right now and a lot going on. And uh, I do think this web telescope is going to play a role in it big time. Um, okay. Lynn Myers from Manhattan, Kansas says, Hey, Chad, I'm absolutely addicted to your Inner Crowd Room podcast. Please don't ever stop. Thank you, Lynn. I wish I had more time to do more. That means a lot to me. Um, I was wondering if Jeremy Corbell has ever responded to you yet. Uh, no, he hasn't. I should have put this question earlier, but no, he has not responded to me. Um, he followed me on Instagram for like four or five months, and I, I just didn't see it. And then when I finally saw it, I accepted him, and I sent him a couple of message, messages in which he didn't respond. So perhaps he's mad. Uh, who knows? I don't know. 
Or maybe he, had, maybe he just hasn't seen it. That's very possible. So, Okay, uh, Donna Clay from Council Bluffs, Iowa. I know Council Bluffs well. Uh, hey, Chad, I saw you were filming in the old market in Omaha. Ah, for your Harbingers movie. That's right, I forgot about this one. I'm kicking myself for not having the courage to say hello. I wanted to get a picture with you so bad because I've been following you since Terra Normal. Well, thank you. That is a very long time. Um, I don't really have a question as much as I just wanted to know how excited I am to see Harbingers keep the films coming. And if I see you in the future, hopefully I won't chicken out. If you see me in the future, uh, uh, Dana, Dana Clay, if you see me in the future, please come and say hello to me. Uh, the only time it, it bothers me when people say hello is when I'm eating dinner. Um, and that's only happened a few times. Outside of that, look, man, I, I love the support from you guys. And I love uh, to meet people out in public. So um, definitely, definitely, uh, Dana, next time uh, I'm in Omaha, if you do come across me, please come and say hello. I would, I would greatly appreciate it. That'd be wonderful. Um, okay, Kim Sherem says, hello, Mr. Kalik. I was wondering if you will be recording and releasing any new in a crowded music in the near future. I know you've been a busy little beaver. <laughs> I, I have been a busy little beaver, but your music assists me with my depression and coping with a loss. So I'm hoping you'll have some more songs coming out. Well, I will have some more songs coming out, uh, that will be in Harbinger's. So thank you, Kim. That really matters to me. Okay. Deanna from Encino, California says, Hey, Chad, I really hope you read this message. My BF and I were wondering if you're going to host any more theatrical events with the post-show Q&A session and the meet and greets. We actually went to the Anaheim Sir No Face tour date for our one-year anniversary. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, which we'll never forget it, as our minds were blown from start to finish. And we almost didn't go, because a month earlier we went to a paranormal event hosted by... I'm not going to I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to throw names out here and put anyone under the bus here, uh, which we barely even got to speak with him. And when we did, he was over... Okay, they're kind of ripping on him here. I don't want to do that, but I understand your point. Um, but we were so thankful and we still talk about your show today, which brings me to my second question. I wonder if you've ever considered doing stand-up comedy. I guess I shouldn't judge people by what I see on television or in movies, but from what we've seen in your film projects, we just never imagined that you would have a venue laughing so much at your answers, especially with the stories you shared about Paranormal State. Um, okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. Um, look, yes, we will be doing theatrical events, uh, but it's not going to be until I finish these three films up that I'm working on right now with Harbingers. Um, I do remember the Anaheim event. I remember it because literally at the same exact time in the same parking lot, because there's a, a massive venue in the parking lot of the baseball stadium, like 50 yards from us, Kendrick Lamar was doing a concert at the same time as our event. And we still had about 500 people come. And I was still going, when I saw it was Kendrick Lamar, I'm like, we are going to get murdered tonight. There's going to be two people here. Um, but no, it actually did pretty well. Um, I'm sorry you went to another event and it didn't pan out. Uh, our events, uh, we try to uh, spend as much time as we can with those uh, that are coming. Uh, I think that's a, just a really important thing. Um, and, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I met you. If you stood in line afterwards, if you went to the VIP. Uh, so I'm glad I got to. Um, and as far as the stand-up thing, I've had people ask me about that before. I, I The whole, I, the one thing, okay, when you start doing things like for a profit, like, you know, or professionally playing music, um making movies it's awesome to be someone who can craft those things but it kind of ruins those things as a spectator for example i just don't watch movies the same way other people do i see the production i see the writing i see all that stuff same thing with music when i go to concerts 
it's just hard for me just to enjoy the concert as it is because I just I've done so many of them. I I just see the production and like I said, that's not a terrible thing, but it's just it changes things. Um, the idea of making laughter a job that scares me. That scares me that I would just become so cynical. And I always hear these stories about how people who are comedians are like like just so crazy and sad and they're just like bitter people and I could see why their job is to just make people laugh and go on and put on a show that they're happy and they're funny and I, yeah I don't know that that could be my thing but I, I look I do like talking to people and entertaining and when I'm doing events I don't want to bring people down I want to have fun so I do have a tendency to joke to joke a lot um in uh, uh, you know at the live events and I guess all I can say to that is I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed it and uh, I don't plan on being funny per se but <laughs> if I said some things that made you laugh that's that's very cool okay next Dino Santos from Trainer Iowa wants to know how is Chapo doing he is doing wonderful but he's teething right now so he's biting the living shit out of everything in this house uh, including uh, my hands when he wants to play and he's very he's doing a lot of biting right now and I know he's just got to get over it but he's he's a lover he is just loves to snuggle loves attention loves to be petted and he is completely infatuated with Laura so yeah really really cute yeah I'm glad he's a part of our life right now and uh, it took me a long time to find him and uh, Thomas also helped me get Chapo uh, for Laura. So, uh, again, thank you, Thomas. And, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's Chapo's amazing. So I will post more videos from him, I promise. Um, let's see. Kathy Joy from uh, Vermilion, South Dakota. Uh, says, new follower to the podcast. Love it. I was just wondering if you went to film school. And if not, how did you learn to make films? Um, I did not go to film school. I went to Iowa State University. They didn't have a film program. I think they did, and they actually ended it the, the year I went there. Um, but they did have a journalism uh, major, which was mine, and it had an emphasis. Uh, Iowa State's one of the weird schools. There's like a minor, but then they also have an emphasis. So my major was journalism. I had a double minor, which was religious studies and sociology, but then my emphasis was electronic media, which basically all it was is like a little, like local television production course. So that's all I really got to do. And um, as far as how did I teach myself, uh, look, you want to do anything enough, you'll you'll learn. You know, same thing with guitar and music and songwriting, vocals, lots of it. Just it was something I was passionate about. And I uh, committed myself to figuring it out. And uh, what did I do? I started making uh, movies. Started out with a one-minute movie, and then a two-minute movie, and then a five-minute movie, and and I made a thousand terrible movies until I figured out what works and what doesn't work. And uh, you know, I really just believe if you really want to do something, you don't have to have a teacher. I mean, look, if you're going to be a doctor or something, yes. If you're going to be a lawyer, yes. Um, but if you're in the arts and you want to do something in the arts and make a living in the arts, you can figure it out. You know, it just, it takes real dedication, real dedication. So, uh, but thank you for asking. Uh, Jackson Harris from Cape Town, South Africa says, I've heard you say on several occasions that to make it as an indie filmmaker, you need two things, work that's worthy of an audience and a great team of people to help you build your career. When it comes to having a good product, that is self-explanatory, as nobody is dying to see a shit film. <laughs> True. Uh, but my question is this. Although making movies in today's world is much more affordable than it was in the past, it still costs money. Even a simple 4K DSLR camera, a lens package, and even a refurbished Mac will run around 5k well, I mean, you can get it a little bit less than that but yeah um, and that's before you shoot a frame indeed uh, and even if you could come up with that film shoots also cost money indeed they do well editing alone is a full-time job I would agree indeed it is <laughs> so how do I keep practicing making films 
so that I can reach a professional level if I can't afford film shoots. And if I can't afford to make films, how can I get a team of people to support my dream? He goes on, he's discovering the double-edged sword of indie filmmaking. Uh, Yes, and everybody discovers this. Um, He says, if I can't afford to make films, how can I get a team of people to support my dream of becoming a filmmaker? It's all very depressing to me. When it comes to money, I'm not poor, but I'm definitely not rich. But I am 28 years old, which rather than chasing my dream... I've spent the last decade of my life talking myself out of it as I stuff dumplings at a local chapped-ass noodle cart. (laughs) It says, as I stuff dumplings at a local chapped-ass noodle cart on wheels. That's funny, man. So he does one of those, uh, uh, what do you call them? Those lunch trucks or whatever. Um, So level with me. Is there a secret that I'm missing? Or should I just let this dream go? Level with you? I think if you're asking the question, you probably made the right decision of not going into this field. Uh, Listen, no one... I didn't have to ask anybody permission or if they think I should do this. It wasn't ever a decision. Uh, I, I... This is me. Like, I do this. Like, I, I tell stories. And multiple ways, music, film, but, you know, film was the way that I had the most natural ability in. Um, But I think if you spend a decade talking yourself out of it, my honest opinion is, yes, you should not do this. You should try whatever you're doing that's working for you. This is a hard business. There's no way around it. I'm not going to bullshit you. This is a difficult, difficult business to survive in. Um, And it takes... Yeah, a great team, and it takes a lot of faith and belief in yourself. And uh, this is an industry where you get told ninety, told no, ninety nine percent of the time. Um, and uh, you know, if if you're fortunate enough to be able to make your own way, make your own films, release them, and find success, I really believe that's the best way to go today. But if yeah, if you want to be a filmmaker, um, As you discovered, it's very hard. Yeah, you're asking the right questions. How do I learn to make films if I don't basically have the money to go do shoots? And also, it kind of goes back to the how do you teach yourself thing. Uh, How bad do you want it? If you want it bad enough, you'll find a way. You know, you will. You'll find a way. And uh, I'm just being completely honest. If you've talked yourself out of this for a decade, it's probably something that you really like and you're really interested in. But I, it's probably not your dream. It's you know when I, when I hear people say that a lot. It's my dream. Is it? I mean, if something's your dream, like don't. I mean, go after it. You know, we have one life, man. One life to live. I blinked my eyes, and I'm 45, man. And I can remember high school memories like yesterday. I mean, it just went by so fast. So if you're listening to this, and I would say in any field, not just filmmaking. If you say something is your dream and, and you're working towards it, like really work towards it. You know, I, I believe most people can truly be something really special if they just believed in themselves and went for it. But it's taking that step. Thomas and I talk about this a lot. Taking that leap. It, the hardest step to take is the first step. It's to say, okay, I'm going to do this. That's the hardest part. Once you've committed to doing it, the rest of it is journey. And as they say, the journey is reward. And I firmly believe that. Um, So if I'm wrong, my friend, I don't want to be the guy to talk you out of going after this. If I'm wrong, then prove me wrong. Like, you know, go out and make it. Um, But I just, I, I never want to tell someone, oh, yeah, you should do it regardless if their heart isn't really in it. Because if it's not, they're probably not going to make it. So... But thank you for the honesty in your question. Uh, a chapped-ass noodle cart. That's funny as hell. Um, Brittany Chapman from Providence, Rhode Island wants to know if I have ever seen those hilarious videos where celebs read or respond to comments from haters. Would you ever be willing to do this? Uh, yeah, I remember putting this, this question in here. Uh, yeah, th- th- here's the truth. I don't get... 
a ton of hate, or at least they don't, uh, hater, not a lot of haters come to my pages. Um, but I, I, you know, everybody gets it, right? So I get it, and I'm sure probably out there in other pages or whatever, I get, you know, hate. I think everybody gets hate that's on the web, especially if you're doing something that works. Um, but I, I guess I just don't, I don't pay attention to it. I pay attention to my social media and my pages, and usually... <clears throat> my, uh, those of you out there that follow me and support me, you guys are awesome. It's usually just, you know, a lot of great comp compliments and comments, but I did find, um, some hater comments that I'll read. I made a list of them here. Um, if that's the, if that's the dare, I guess this is right. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. I'm just trying to find which ones would be the funniest. Uh, well, here's one I thought was kind of kind of interesting. You remember a couple of podcasts ago, I opened the podcast up apologizing for the fact that it had been like a couple of weeks since I made a podcast. And uh, Marco S. responds, geez, dude, after apologizing and promoting, it took 18 minutes to get it. Respectfully requesting you to curtail, if possible. <laughs> hey, what can I say, man? I felt... I felt bad, and I am long-winded as a person. Period. So if that bothers you, uh, I you know I apologize. It's not going to change. I can promise you that. Um, uh, Brian Thompson says this guy makes some pretty entertaining documentary movies, but they're all bullshit. <laughs> There's nothing in my documentaries that are bullshit. Nothing. Um, but listen, I understand if you're going to be in the world of the paranormal, making films in the paranormal, you are going to have haters. That is just how it goes. And people are going to think that you're lying and bullshitting. I can, uh, I promise you on my daughter's soul, there is nothing in my films that's bullshit. Um, but that's funny. This guy makes some pretty entertaining movies, <laughs> but they're all bullshit. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Oh, this is just kind of... I guess kind of questioning me. It just says, it was after my um, podcast about Corbell and DeLong, this guy says, so summation, Jeremy Corbell and Tom DeLong are liars that work for the government. They're intentionally and knowingly spreading lies and fear. And the government doesn't care and need to abide by uh, information or federal information request acts. The documents are not real and the videos are obvious fakes. Hmm. <laughs> That's why I said the end. Hmm, like I'm lying. Um, first off, again, this is funny. Uh, that is not the summary. <laughs> That's your summary <laughs> of my podcast. Um, Corbell and DeLong. I'm not saying I know for a fact they're liars. I'm saying some things they've said don't make sense. And again, I'm inviting them to have a discussion with me. Or just tell the public and answer the public's questions. Forget Chad Kalick. The same questions I have, so does the public. Answer them. Uh, they're intentionally and knowingly spreading lies and fear. It could that just could be possible? I'm not saying I know for a fact they are. I'm saying it certainly appears that way. The government doesn't care nor need to abide by federal uh, information requests. Uh, no, they don't. If you believe that you can just you know file a federal information request and just you know. Send it on to the government and they'll just send you whatever you want. <laughs> no, that's not the case. There are people that have spent decades trying that route and have gotten nothing. The documents are not real and the videos are obvious fakes. Uh, never once have I said any of those videos are fake. Um, the three, you know, the Tic Tac, the Go Fast, the Gimbal, uh, those are all real videos. Uh, what they show, I don't know. It doesn't look mind-blowing, I'll tell you that. The triangle one, that wasn't fake. I'm, I was saying that they weren't triangles, that there was a bokeh effect, and they weren't they weren't triangle craft. They weren't. Um, but it's not fake of what happened. Never call them fake, just, just trying to say. This one kind of, uh, I don't want to say pissed me off, but it, it, it bothered me just because I... When people don't watch things but have an opinion, it bothers me. Anyways, it says, 
Uh, this was in the in the same. It was a response in the same podcast about debunking the triangles. It says, "Okay, so there's no multiple triangles, but there's still a triangle. Why are you trying to debunk anyone when you exposed your own mother's mental illness to the world and claimed it to be demonic possession?" Okay, let's start line by line. Okay, so there's no multiple triangles, but there's still a triangle. No, there's no triangles. Period. There's no triangles. That's what I said. There's none. And there's not. So that's a fact. Okay, that's not me picking on anybody. That's me saying that's a bokeh effect. And there is no triangle. There is no triangle craft that the U.S. Omaha filmed. And it says, who are you to try and debunk anyone? Um, I'm a person like anybody else. I don't think you have to be anything special to try to, to debunk anyone. I'm also somebody who works with film and video and I work in the paranormal. And I have worked with video footage for 20-some years. Um, So that's who I am. That also doesn't make me any less important than the average person. And he says, you exposed your own mother's mental illness to the world and claimed it to be demonic possession. This on its face is factually incorrect. Uh, I invite you to watch American Ghost Hunter, Lisa, L-I-S-S-A. I invite you to watch American Ghost Hunter because... Clearly, you haven't watched it. I never planned on doing an interview with my mother whatsoever. We went to my parents' house to interview my father. My mother erupts in front of us. And then at that point, because I care for my mother, I have no choice but to get her help and to try to discover what is going on. The reason she was claiming is that she was demonically possessed, and my dad believed this, and uh, I was on the fence about it, because I don't know demonic possession. But what I do know is that incredibly bizarre things happened growing up in that house when she wasn't around, okay? And I've also been around her where she does not appear to be her in any fashion, which you saw that on film. There was a long conversation with my parents as to whether or not we were going to move forward with actually documenting it because the process was going to be, as I say in the film very clearly, to get her not only medical help but spiritual help. Okay? Never once do I conclude at the end that I know for a fact that she is, uh, in fact, possessed. Ultimately, it is my belief that she is. But at that time, I'm just trying to determine, is this what is known as demonic possession? Or is this multiple personality disorder or schizophrenia of some kind? But then I get to a place where I'm like, couldn't they both be the same? Because when you're saying someone's demonically possessed, all of the same signs are the same size of like schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder. The only difference is there was some truly bizarre paranormal things that were happening to multiple people that made me believe that this could in fact be the case. After Lorraine met with her, uh, and remember, that's why Lorraine was coming to the house to determine, to determine if there was in fact something paranormal going on with her. At the end of the day, I just didn't know who to trust or who to believe more. My honest-to-God feeling after going through all of that again, I just felt like there there was. There's something something that has control of her. But regardless, as the film says, two paths were laid out before my mother. One was to seek psychiatric help, which we would get her that, and the other one was spiritual help. Now, why wouldn't I do that? This is my mother we're talking about. Okay, whether or not her and I have our differences is the only mother I have. Why would I not do everything in my power to help her? And you got to understand that I've been going on for 20 years, man. 20 years. And then just seeing the way she acted around Lorraine, and there was just a lot of things. Things that I can't even personally talk about because they're just very, very personal. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to get her help, period. And I tried in both facets. <clears throat> and as far as showing it to the world, I'm extremely proud of that decision. There are so many people that deal with this and feel like they're completely alone, that they're crazy, that, uh, you know, the, 
trust me, trust me, and we meet them all the time on cases of people who are, are suicidal because they feel like they have nowhere to turn, that nobody will ever listen to them, that this can't be real. So to put that out there, to actually have people see that, as my father said, it's one of the only things that made living through all of that worthwhile, that the film exists. It turned something negative into something positive. It really did. And I've received thousands of letters from people who were touched, people who experienced the same thing. So I'm very proud of that. Um, so I'm not as much angry at your response as I'm just kind of let down that you didn't, you didn't watch the movie. You didn't. Because if you did, there's no way you walk away going, he exposed his mother's mental illness and then claimed it to be demonic possession. No, the whole crux of the movie was my indecision of saying, what is it? Is it mental illness or is it possession? And in the end, I chose to just try to get help for both. That's it. So, anyways, so there's me reading some hater stuff, I guess. Uh, I don't know if that was fun or not, but if <laughs> if it was fun, then uh, you know we can do that some more in the future, I guess. Um, John Abdo from Denver, Colorado says, uh, "Hey Chad, what do you think of this new drug? New drug? Sorry. Hey Chad, what do you think of this new drug, Trank, and what it has done to Philadelphia? Have you seen the Kensington Street videos?" Uh, I had not, but I went and watched them, and uh, yeah, it's horrifying. Um, if you guys haven't seen this, this trank drug, it just, people get really whacked out, and they try to stand up when their body wants to go to sleep, and they just, like, bend over, and you just find them just bent in half, and they just stand that way for hours. So you go on this Kensington Street, this street in Philadelphia, which I know of Kensington Street. It's a it's an age old open air drug market in Philly. It's been around forever, um, but it just looks like a bunch of zombies. So what do I think about it? It's horrifying, um, horrifying, and I don't know what else to add to that. But horrifying. Okay, and last but not least, uh, Sophia Murphy from Darwin, Australia, wants to know if I saw the UFO footage from the air show in Florida and if I thought it was real. Um, I did see the UFO footage from the air show in Florida. Uh, if you look at the screen right now, it's right here. Give it a watch. And Sophia... From growing up on the beach in uh, Galveston Island in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, down there in Texas, uh, I don't believe this is a UFO that comes out of the water. Uh, I believe this is a seagull that is flying up by the plane. Um, a lot of birds around the beach in the Gulf will swing down into the water. They'll fly into the water and they'll they'll eat fish. They'll pick up fish out of the water, um, and a lot of them. Um, will go in the water and they'll just sit on the waves and they'll look for fish and they'll grab them and go flying away. Uh, I think this is a big seagull or some kind of big bird that's on the water looking for fish. And I think when the plane pulls up, it just skadoodles out of there. And I think it's moving fast and it flies up and towards the camera. Um, I don't think it is a UFO. I think it's a bird. Um, that's my honest opinion. So anyways, uh, much love everybody. And this has been a long one. Uh, but I thank you all for listening. Uh, also, I'm on TikTok now. If you haven't added me there, please do. Uh, it's under at Chad Kalick, just one word, how it sounds. And, uh, if you have more questions for me, as always, just, uh, leave them in the comment sections, um, or contact me on any of my social medias. And, uh, yeah, I will be back tomorrow with more. All the best.